We want to talk about family today, the church family. And, um, you know, sometimes families have difficulties, don't they? Yeah, personalities that rub you the wrong way in your family. Things that drive you, drive you crazy. But don't you wish everybody in your family was like you and there would be no issues? You know, I mean, that would be great. If everybody was like me, it would be cool. Everybody would be quiet. Wouldn't talk loud. Wouldn't get excited about anything. You should have heard me yesterday. You should have heard me yesterday. Oh, my goodness. I, I, my, my sister lives in India, and I said, did you hear me? And uh, I was watching the Michigan game, of course, and... Uh, we won, um, and uh, but it, it was a good time. Uh, and family is so important, isn't it? I believe that you feel you have the best family in the world. I'm sorry, I do. Okay, I do. My grandkids are most beautiful. I don't care about your grandkids. Okay, my kids are awesome. I don't care about your kids. No, that's not true. We're very proud of our family. We're very thankful for our family. We just came out of the Thanksgiving season. And um, we had, we had our, uh, two of our kids' families over uh, for Thanksgiving. And um, I have to confess. I have a confession to make. Several years ago, as I was driving up here real quick, I hit a deer on the way up and with a truck that I borrowed. And we had something going on here, uh, trunk or treat. And afterwards, I went to the sheriff's office down in Centerville, I think it's called. I, man, I, it was like forever drive. And I get there, and they don't like how I was acting, so they gave me a breathalyzer test. Okay? Now, I came out clean. There was no alcohol there. Okay? But Thanksgiving Day, I got drugged into jail. My granddaughters came out. Pap, pap. They both grabbed my hands, and they dragged me off to jail. They sat me down on a bench in our bedroom and said, you stay there. I was in jail for 20 minutes. It was driving me nuts. I said, I gotta go, I can't do this. You stay there. And I went to get up. They shut the door on me. <laughs> They're pushing on it like crazy. And these are two little girls four and five years old, and I'm trying to open the door. And I'm scared to death if I put my arm out there, they're going to break it or something. I couldn't believe the strength of these two little girls. I finally got out. But I was in jail. Families are important, aren't they? They're important. They're precious. They're gifts. And this is what family should be. Family should be a place of safety. You're safe there. I know not all families have experienced that. But family should be safe. Family should be full of love. There should be unity. Unity in a family. Sometimes there's sacrifice in a family. You have to sacrifice. You support one another. A good family supports each other through the tough times and the good times. And the good times. Don't take those little things for granted. Celebrate them. Celebrate them. 
belief in one another. Man, I'm telling my kids all the time, man, you're, you're awesome. I'm proud of you. Believe in each other. Encourage each other. There should be security. Trust needs to be there. You should be able to be yourself. You know what? My kids correct me. There are times they will correct me. And you know what? I am good with it. I am really good with it because I know the intent of their heart is not to get even with me. Most of the time. They love me. So when they, they don't challenge me, they will kindly tell me, you know what, Dad, I think you were wrong. You know what, I'm so thankful for that. That's part of being a family, too. Discipline has to happen both ways. Both ways. We have not attained yet. And fa good families listen. They listen. When we were raising our children, we sat at the table every dinner time. And we found out so much about their day. Found out about them. Sit at the table. You know, and, and we had fun around the table. Uh, Francine, when she makes sauerkraut, she makes these dumplings. And Tiffany and I fight over them. Even to this day, if she makes them, she'll tell Tiffany she made them. And I said, why did you do that? Because she's going to take some of those dumplings and give them to her. And when, one time we were sitting around the table, and I took a dumpling that I was going to give Tiffany, and I poured all kinds of salt and pepper on it. And I gave it to her, hoping she wouldn't like it. She didn't. She, she, she liked it, no matter what. And so, you know, I lose out there. But we had fun around the table. There's something about sitting around a table, you get to know each other more. And that's why we have this thing called Fellowship Sunday. It's only, and sometimes we have it in the bulletin to encourage everyone to get together with another family and just share a meal with them. You know, like last week, we shared a meal around tables. And I heard a comment that, you know, it was just good fellowship. Got to know each other just a little bit better. You know, you may say, well, man, I know these people. I've known them for years. Well, find somebody you don't know. Find somebody you don't know and get to know them. So, um, but unfortunately, we live in a day and an age where the enemy is at work to steal, kill, and destroy. He's at work. And he is destroying the family unit. He's at work trying to destroy that by being open to everything and anything, not having a balance of right and wrong. We all know that so many things that were wrong years ago, they're okay now. They're right. Not okay, they're right. And those things are solid and God, um, God's Word based. They're not right now. And there's this imbalance. And we have families that are struggling. And when families struggle, there's loneliness. We live... We have a generation coming up, they are so lonely. But they interact on phones all the time. But there's lo they're, they're lonely because we were created in God's image to have fellowship with each other, to interact with each other. There's something about a human touch it brings life to you. Loneliness. Family, true, good, solid family values are not passed on to the next generation. There's lack of direction. 
we're believing that there are some who believe that a five-year-old could decide his destiny. You know, it, it can't happen. Crime is in the in, on the increase because of the destruction of the family. Child abuse. How many times do we read in the paper, or hear on the news that a baby died because he was the baby was in the care of so and so's boyfriend? Abuse takes place. Physical, sexual, mental abuse. Drugs are on the rise. Alcohol abuse, depression, lack of discipline. They're not taught to stick it, stick it out through tough times. Let me tell you, Growing up in our house it was awful. It was awful. My parents fought more than they talked to each other. It was awful. But you know what they taught me? You stick it out through the tough times. And Fortunately, my mom was a God-fearing woman who prayed and believed that if she was true, God would work it out. And later on, my dad did accept Christ. He was a deacon in the church. My dad! Oh, my gosh! I learned you stick it out through the tough times. You talk to people in the greatest generation, and many of them will say, I never even thought about it. You just work it out. But now we don't want to work it out. We just want to, well, if I can't have my way, so long. You tough it out. You work through the hard times. You grow through the hard times. And that's missing in so many people's lives today. So many people are missing out. And the church is a family. We are, how many remember the days where we called each other brother and sister? Some of us still do, especially when we don't remember your name. <laughs> Hey, brother. I don't remember your name, so hey, brother, you know. I never knew some of the older people's first names because it was always brother so-and-so. We're a church family. And in some ways, we're missing it. Now, I'm not saying let's go back to the brother and sister, okay? I'm not. But I remember this one time at work. It was a Saturday. Of course, I was working Saturday, and I had to go talk to the uh, uh, plant um, administrator. She was working there. She was working on books, and her two kids were there. And Jenny and I, we, we had a good relationship, and we were, you know, real friendly. And even now when I see her, she'll give me a hug, you know, in, in the Lowe's parking lot. And her husband looked at her like, what? You know, but she, he didn't know who I was. So, but uh, Jenny Carroll, she introduced me to her kids. This is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so. I don't remember their names. But then she said, this is Mr. Mitchell. I said, no, Ted. And right there, right there, I said, I took away, away from Jenny. She was trying to teach her kids respect. And I stole that from her. 
let people call you Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so. It's called respect. Now kids walk up to you and they call you by your first name. Whose fault is it? It's ours. It's ours. Some things, they are really wise. But we've gone away from so many of it. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. It's a very, I, I use it quite a bit, but we're going to look at it again. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And <clears throat> as we go through this, understand that we are a close-knit bunch here, okay? So I'm not addressing anything. I'm trying to encourage something. Take it to the next level to really care about each other and live life, live this thing called life together. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Please stand as we read his word. They, the church, the church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Father, speak to us in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to, I want to point out some things that aren't mentioned here. I want to, the church grew. And there's no mention of this in the Bible. There was not an awesome praise band. It wasn't a super, well, it was a friendly church, but, you know, that's not what they based everything on. It was a loving church. Nothing said about the powerful messages. It was the teachings of the apostles, and people were doing what the apostles were teaching, and miracles were taking place, not only in the apostles' life, but into the individual's life as well. There were no charismatic personalities. Nobody's mentioned the apostles in general, but not one person. They don't talk about a fantastic children's ministry where kids could go down the slides to get to their classroom and, you know, with all the bells and whistles and stuff. No awesome youth ministry. No coffee shop in the lobby. Didn't talk about elaborate facilities that had everything. The latest technology, smoke and fire and all this stuff and the light show and all that stuff. And they didn't talk about an awesome church sign. They were obedient to the word of God. And God blessed the church because they lived it out. It wasn't, oh yeah, I've heard this before. Let's, make, let's move on. It was, how can, how can I put this into action in my life? How can I live this out tomorrow? When I speak, I try to do that. I, I try to make it more personal, more real, and more livable. But I know it doesn't always come through. But the early church was alive. And, you know, the world has enough bickering going on. 
We have politicians now standing up in trying to instigate a physical fight. We have name calling, we have all this total disrespect in the next generation coming up. I'm thinking, what are they seeing? They're seeing childish actions in an adult body. Sometimes even within the church. If you get online, if you go to YouTube, you can, you can find these people that are nitpicking everybody's ministry. And the world is seeing it. Calling each other false prophets, false preachers, all this stuff. And the world's seen it. When we read the last part of this verse, remember, it said, they found favor with all the people because they saw what was going on. I don't know about you, but if I, if I know there's an organization where there's just total chaos and arguing and all that, you know what, I don't want to be a part of it. Families to be unified. Not unified in just working projects out, but unified in how we live this Christian life. Not that I'm not I'm not even talking about being a cult that you know you do everything that I say or somebody else. I'm not saying that. But being obedient to the Holy Spirit when He speaks to you to change your life. If your life hasn't changed in the last six weeks, you need to get closer to Jesus. I don't, I don't know. I don't, there are times I feel like, okay, I know you're there, God, but I really don't sense you. But even through that, God's drawn me closer. He's drawn me closer. I want to challenge you, don't be comfortable where you're at with Christ. Don't be comfortable. Because the enemy will come and he will steal, kill, and destroy. And it's subtle sometimes. When it's subtle, that's the most powerful tool he has. Get comfortable. Just kick back. Enjoy the ride. You said Jesus coming into my heart, so that's all there is. That's false teaching. When we say, Jesus, I accept you, and I will follow you. It's not just up here. It's life changing. Life changing. That's what it is. The early church grew together. They fellowshiped together. They prayed together and they ate together. They lived life together. The church is to be a family, isn't it? We're to be a family. We're, we're to share each other's needs, encourage each other, love each other, lift each other up. First John 3 says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is who we are. We just said that is who we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. We are called the children of God. And you know what? A couple weeks ago, we had the privilege of, of dedicating Grayson, our grandson. Flesh and blood there's no connection, but he's ours. 
He's iron. He's a family. He's part of the family. I think he's going to tear it all down, but, uh, you know, physically he's going to tear the house down. He's into everything. He's a brute. We are his, we are God's children. We're his. We have people around us. We're God's children, and we're brothers and sisters. We have people on the other side of the globe. They're our brother and our sister. We have this wonderful thing called family. Galatians 6.10 says this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Especially to one another. Does it mean we forget those outside? No. No. But we pray for each other. We lift each other up. Those things that people are taught never leave them. Mary texted us, I think, and Sam, as far as I know, he hasn't been in church in years, right? He said, ask the church to pray for the fellow who hit me. It doesn't leave. It does not go away. You have a child away from the Lord, it doesn't go away, it doesn't leave. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep praying, keep believing, keep trusting. God is there. Romans 8, 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. We're, we are His children. We're part of His family, each and every one of us. And again, like I said, there are people in your family, your physical family, that, that just grind you. Let's be honest, there are going to be people within our church that are just going to grind you. But you don't stop loving them. You don't stop, you know, trusting them. You don't stop pouring your life into them. They're still part of the family. And it's a natural thing that people with like interests draw together, okay? It's just natural that that happens. Uh, Sam likes NASCAR. And there, there are guys that just draw to that and that's their kind of magnet that pulls them together. You know, there, there, are, there are like interests. There are some of you that like scrapbooking and you draw it together. You know, there's that kinship, that friendship. It's just going to happen. It doesn't mean we're cliques. It just means we have joint interests. But the other side of that is we need to welcome others into our circle. And, you know, just like I used Grayson as an example, Man, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. When we have little kids here and they're acting up, people just look over and smile. You don't get angry. You don't get upset. You just look over and say, oh, that's so sweet. Keep the noise coming. But how come when somebody comes in that's an adult and they don't exactly know how to do church? Or maybe they said something that, man, doesn't agree with what I agree with. And we kind of push them away. They hurt my feelings. Well, my goodness, pity you. You know, we're going to have people come in 
I believe that. I trust that. And as we get closer to Jesus, it's going to happen. People are going to get saved here. We're going to have baptismals. We're going to see families come together. We teach by example. We teach by example. I've shared this many times, but this, this is something that just sticks with me so much. I learned how to pray on Sunday nights, kneeling next to prayer warriors. I would listen into their prayers and I would learn. Learn how to pray. Learn how to intercede. And I've talked to other pastors. And they say, we invite people to come down to pray, and they don't they don't want to they don't want to do that. It's our culture today. But we are missing out teaching one another. Have our young people learned how to pray? Have our young people learned how to truly worship? Worship past the music. Isn't he just as holy after the music as during the music? Jesus, again, was a perfect example. He, uh, in John chapter 13, it was uh, the, the last meal, the last supper, and, you know, Jesus got everybody together. They get into this big room, and they have this, this Passover meal. There's no servants there to wash the feet of the disciples and wash Jesus' feet. And nobody wants to lower themselves to do that because that was the servant, the lowest servant. That was their responsibility. The evening meal was in progress and the devil was already prompting Judas, the son of uh, Simon uh, Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew what the Father had, that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and took off the outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Peter, he goes from one extreme to another. Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Don't stop at my feet. And Jesus said, those who have uh, a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, referring to Judas. When he had finished washing the feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done. Jesus taught by example. We all know this. We learn more from someone's example than their words. 
I learned ministry by watching my senior pastor. I learned things to do, and I also learned things not to do, okay? Because it didn't fit me. I'm not saying he did things wrong. I'm just saying it just does not fit me, my personality and stuff. I learned that you, when someone's having surgery and COVID just really took all this away, but when, when somebody's having surgery, you stay with the family. You don't just go in and pray and leave and check up later. You stay with the family till the doctor comes out. You're there in those battles. And as uh, Pastor Eric Jarvis, our presbyter and a good friend of mine, he's made comment a couple times. He said, no one has ever come up to me and said, because of that message, it changed my life. But they said, you were there when I was going through a difficult time, and that changed my life. It's not the word spoken from a pulpit. It's what you live out. How many know talk is cheap? Talk is cheap. But people watch. We're watching one another, whether we want to admit it or not. We're watching one another. I'm learning from you. I watch you. I want to learn. I want to, I want to grow in this thing called ministry. And it's becoming a servant. I went, I went to Bible college. I passed the test with the Assemblies of God. I'm an ordained minister. I've got it on my wall. I can show you. You know what? I want to learn how to minister. I want to learn how to give. I want to learn how to lift people up. I want people to know this loving God that gave everything for me and you. I want to see life changing, not because, ah, see why well, it was right. No, I want you to, I want you to know God's peace that passes all understanding. I want you to know God's healing power. I want you to know God's truth. You reap what you sow. That's what family does. First Peter 2 says this, To this we were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Remember the passage we, we just read when he, he was at the Last Supper? He said, all authority has been given to me by the Father. He had all authority. He could have wiped them out. But it said, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him, God the Father, who judges justly. He knew God would bring it all around. Philippians chapter 4 says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is right, pure, lovely, uh, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Turn the news off. I forget where I was. Uh, oh, we were having lunch at uh, uh, Wyman's. 
and on the screen, dogs have an unknown disease. Now, this is not because I'm not crazy about animals. But I don't need that to worry about. You know, and then the next storyline was another thing that you could just drive you crazy if you, you really dwelt on it. Paul says, be careful what you put in. Be careful what you put in. You just put in that positive stuff. Whatever you have learned and received or heard from me, this is Paul talking, or seen in me, put into practice. I think that's a good test. Would you want a fellow believer to follow you 24-7 and do everything that you're doing? That's kind of scary, isn't it? It's scary. It's scary. Now, if you followed me up today, I was a very good boy. No road rage, no anxiety, nothing. It was, it was pretty cool. So I would like you to have been with me today. So, uh, but, you know, we, we learn so much by just watching each other. Can we say, do as I do in my Christian walk? Do as I do. First Timothy 4 says this, Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Now, we're not doing it for show, are we? We're not doing it to say, oh, look at me, look at me. But we want others to see God working in us. I want you to see God working in me. It's not a prideful thing. I used to be ashamed of being broken when I talked about things, but now I feel like it's a gift. He said, let others see the growth that's taking place in your life. How can that happen if we don't do life together? Watch your life and doctrine closely. This is Paul talking to Timothy, but he's talking to you and me too. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Those that are around, that are watching you. You will not only save yourself, but you will save those around you. How many ministers have we seen fall? And there have been those who have fallen. Thousands of people walked away. Thousands of people walked away because of one person. That's why the enemy usually goes for leadership. If you're in a, in a position of leadership, the enemy is going to try to get you. Try to discourage you so others will see it, maybe, you know, whatever. That's why we need to pray for our leaders. The leaders within our church, we need to pray for them. And it goes beyond me. We have people that you look up to, you respect, and you need to pray for them, that they are strong. We all have those people in our lives. <coughs> church is family. Again, a good, healthy church welcomes new members, welcomes them does not hold them off at arm's length, but embraces them. And uh, it's nothing new that sometimes that happens in a church. We just went through uh, the book of Galatians, 
and Paul all through there was, was making a point. Because you're uncircumcised does not mean that you're not part of the body. Circumcision need, means nothing. You're part of the family of God. We need to embrace each other. Now, I heard comment, and I'm going to share this openly. I heard comment that there are times where people ask, can I help? And we, we respond by saying, no, we've got this. And I'm probably the most guilty one here. And we need to invite others to be part of it. Uh, again, I've shared that, you know, we've worked on projects here in, in, at the church. And, you know, as I've worked with, with some of you, it's been a good time to get to know each other a little bit better. We still love each other. That's the miracle of it all. But there's something that happens when you work together. When, when we had the, the, um, the carnival just a couple weeks ago, people came together that we got to know each other maybe on a first name basis for the first time. We're not a huge church, but we don't know each other's names sometimes. And we got to know each other because we work together, we minister together. And that's so important. The church at Ephesus, it was not accepting the Gentile believers. They were pushing them off. They were not part of the Jewish faith, so the, the church at Ephesus was holding them at arm's length, and yet they were believers. And Paul addresses it. It's amazing how these letters address issues within the church. It tells us the church is not perfect. Why? Because there's human beings in it. There's egos. There's pride. There's selfishness. This is my ministry. I've always done it. Nobody else is going to do it. Let me tell you, I know it's hard to let go of some stuff. But we all have seasons in our life that we minister in different ways. And those seasons change. And also, it gives us opportunity to disciple someone else to be part of that. We need to pull people in and let them be part of it. I don't know if you noticed, but do, do you notice that we have three guys that open and pray? And did you, did you notice that in the service now? Because I want to pull other people in. That I'm not the only one up here. I want you to look up to these men because they're leaders within our church. And I want to show them off. There's a, you know what? If somebody could preach, be, preach, let them preach. I'll sit down. I mean, this is no ego trip here. As I've said, I come here with fear and trembling sometimes. God, I want to get your word right. I don't want to be self-serving. There's no ego here. Matthew chapter 5 says this, if you, love, <coughs> if you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others do? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Embrace one another. Not just those that you have that common interest in, but embrace those that come in. And let them be part of your ministry, part of what's going on. And let them grow with you. <coughs> Matthew 5, uh, 25, uh, the familiar verse where the, the king uh, says that all should come. 
He says, come and uh, you are blessed by the Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger and you invited me in, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to me to visit me. You never visited me on Thanksgiving Day. Then the righteous will uh, say to him, Lord, when we, did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty when you gave, gave you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothed you? When you did it to the sick, you did it unto me. When you, I tell you the truth, whatever you do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do for me. We all know that scripture. But how come we still hold our hand to arm's length? Like, stay away. We're family. Embrace one another. Embrace one another. Part of the passage here was, you clothe one another. This is a good time to, to mention this, this ministry that we're doing. There's a box back there that we're going to collect winter clothing and give to a, a, a group that distributes it to the homeless and those in need. So if you have something that you haven't worn for 20 years, if you haven't worn it for a while, and it's something that you could bless somebody else with, now don't, don't bring in something that's torn and ragged that you wouldn't give to somebody you love, okay? Sometimes we give our junk and say, oh, this is my best, you know? But if you have something that you could donate, that, that's what that's back there for, and uh, Nancy's coordinating that. So if you have any questions, uh, see her. But this is an opportunity for us to love Jesus. To love Jesus. And there are times, you know, I'm human. There are times I say, man, I just don't want to go see that person. And the Lord just drops it in my head. When you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. I'm loving Jesus when I do this. When you bring those clothes, you're loving Jesus. When you send that text, you're loving Jesus. When you make that call, you're loving Jesus. Love him this week. Encourage somebody within our church body this week. I, I get encouragements from you, and it just lifts, lifts me up throughout the day. Somebody really appreciates me. Man, that's awesome. I know I, you do, but when you hear it, when you read the words in a text or you hear it, it make, it's totally different. And what a gift that we have opportunity to put into action. A good family, a healthy family, a healthy church family uses discipline sparingly and constructively. We don't go around beating each other up, okay? We look out for each other. Uh, there, there's a situation in our family where uh, a big decision has to be made. We were sitting around the Thanksgiving table and we were talking about it. And I, I just talked to my son a few minutes and just said, oh, have you considered this? Do you, have you thought about this? This kind of stuff. And that's part of discipling. Discipline is discipling. And he knew the intent of my heart. It wasn't to say you're wrong by doing this or anything or even thinking about it. it was, I was just trying to help him along. And really, that, that's, what, that's what you and I need. As I said earlier, my kids come and they correct me. I, I, I appreciate it. I really, you know what, they, when they do that, I say, man, they really love me. They're not getting in my business. They love me. 
And if your heart is pure when you go and talk to somebody who's struggling or who needs some guidance through discipline or direction, I believe that will come through. If it doesn't, just pray the Holy Spirit reveals it to them. But let's love each other enough to keep us safe. To keep us safe. And again, I'm not saying let's get into everybody's business. I'm not even going there. But let's look out for each other. First Peter 4, 8 says this, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers that struggle that your brother or sister in Christ is going through. And that love will cover that sin, that shortcoming. Again, sin is a shortcoming. You're not, you haven't made the target, you haven't hit the target, and you've sinned, you've fallen short of it. Doesn't mean you're not trying. Sometimes you just need that encouragement. That's what a family does. We face challenges together. The early church had to do that over and over again. The, the stoning of Stephen. They had to rally together. They had to, they had to uh, draw strength from one another. <clears throat> they face that challenge. And if you read after the stoning of Stephen, it says the church continued to grow. And the religious people saw what was going on, and some of them became believers. The world is watching. Things are tough. How many know things are tough for the church today? The church is on the decline, attendance-wise. The message seems like it's falling on deaf ears. Okay? The world is watching. Are we going to cave? Or are we going to stand strong? Are we going to become more unified in more following the disciples' teaching and putting them into action in our life? And we're seeing Jesus change us. The church's family. Romans 8. I'm going to read several scriptures here. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit was given, has given life that has set you free. It's free from the law and sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because of uh, it was weak by the flesh, God did, uh, God did by sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he con uh, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous, righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled and met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on the things of the fleshly desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God. Don't we know that? It does not submit to God's laws, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in that realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, 
So even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, He also he will also raise you to life immortal because the Spirit that gives life. Therefore, brothers and sisters, again, family, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. But if we live according to the flesh, we, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live your life in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. The Spirit Himself testified with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share, we share in the suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. We need to share in his suffering. In his suffering. We need to stop believing this false teaching that if you're following Christ, you won't have any rough times. We say we don't teach that, but we believe that. We believe it. We need to share in his sufferings as well. And we grow through suffering. We grow strong through suffering. We are heirs with Christ. And he wants to change my life and your life on a daily basis. He wants to transform it. Again, family, church family does not depend on a lot of things. But it depends on the fellowship we have in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, so we can not fulfill the desires of the flesh, and that brings unity. That brings unity in the church. And we have unity here. There's no disunity. So don't start any rumors. I'm so thankful for this church. But I don't want us to be comfortable. Could you imagine having a family that doesn't go through struggles together, through tough times together, joyful times together? That's what we want to do. We want to be a family that brings lo uh, safety, love, unity, sacrifice, support, encouragement, security, trust, a listening brother and sister that we're able to be ourselves. I appreciate you letting me be myself with all the dumb jokes, to go Michigan, that's who I am, and I want you to be who you are. I don't want to be something fake up here. I don't want you to be fake. If you're hurting today, you're with family. If you're struggling today, you're with family. If you need to cry today, you're with family. You need encouragement today, you're with family. Let's all stand.
If you can get the second song ready, please, Abby. I think many times some of us come here and we leave with the same burden, the same hurt, the same struggle that we walked in with and we feel so lonely. I know because I've been there, done that. We feel so lonely. And you just say, I wish I had somebody just to trust with this. Sometimes just letting it go just, just gives so much freedom. As we sing this song, if you're hurting today, we want to pray for you. If you're struggling today, we want to pray for you. We're not going to get in your business. We just want to pray for you. We want to cry with you. Because you can't share in the victory unless you go through the struggle. You can't do it. Thank you for being family. We're going to leave this place, but don't stop praying for those that came up. Don't stop praying for them. Because the enemy's not done with his part. Okay? There's going to be discouragement that comes. Pray that that discouragement just diminishes as Christ meets that need. Pray for one another. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor because you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. But God, you give us this grace. And you give us these promises that when two or three are gathered together, you are there. Your power is there. And Father, you will meet that need. You will answer that prayer. And Father, we pray prayers. And God, we believe and we trust that you will do miracles. Begin today, we pray. In your name, go with us in your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hugs.